Mr. Speaker, let me start off by saying that I believe that this initiative is a commendable initiative and the government deserves being commended for this initiative, for introducing this initiative. And uh, I accept that the initiative has been very carefully thought out. I am aware in these matters as well, Mr. Speaker, that there are limitations. And there are so many limitations, some of which have been addressed by members. I think I just heard a member for the Fort North, for example, pointing out the debilitating consequences and effects of COVID. And others, the limitations of finance, resources, and so on. But perhaps one of the greatest limitations has to do with the thinking of the agencies that we have to deal with. As in this case, for example, the Caribbean Development Bank, or for that matter, the World Bank, because they have very strange notions of social assistance, social support, social rehabilitation, and it's never ever easy to have to cope with these agencies and their very bureaucratic approaches to dealing with real problems or the problems of ordinary people. They are in fact exceedingly jaundiced in their views and the burden that we have to carry is the burden of technocrats, the way they think, the way they reason, the way they deal with issues. And sometimes a very difficult responsibility is cast on governments to maneuver themselves through that maze to get the support that countries need, governments need, and, and, and persons need. So it's a limitation that I don't think we should be shy to talk about from time to time. It's a limitation that we, I mean, should address because it applies to all governments, whichever the government that is in office or in power. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Minister for Equity helpfully clarified the heads on the which assistance will go to the people of, of the country. And I think we have been told that some 8,000 persons overall will, will benefit. He explained, carefully explained uh, cash transfers and, and what they would mean. I think he indicated, for example, some 766,000 US dollars will go to public assistance. I was particularly pleased that the member um, indicated that um, persons with disabilities would be targeted. Um, that again is commendable and I believe he pointed out that grants are currently $200 per month and that will increase to a payment of $400 for six months. Now, Again, I, I spoke of the limitations that governments have to work with and all throughout his presentation, the Honorable Member made the point that this is assistance for a specific period of time, six months being touted constantly. So six months really is not much time to play with, but then we have to be reminded of the share cost because this is going to cost overall nearly $14 million in six months. So again, Sometimes we can't have our cake and eat it. But I was pleased by the increase in disability grants for different reasons. The first, of course, is that this was a grant that the former um, government um, introduced when I had the honor to serve the country as prime minister. And I recall that at the last budget sitting of that government, before general elections, we had increased the allocation, the monthly allocation from $200 a month, I believe either to 275 or 250 because we are always acutely aware that $200 for the parents of challenged children, disabled children, really, in this day and age is no money at all um, with inflation at the current rate. So 
Mr. Speaker, this is really a, a, a drop in a bucket. But again, we have to give thanks to small mercies. But I say this, Mr. Speaker, to make the point to really deal with the thinking of the former UWP administration. Um, and we heard so much from the leader of the opposition because, you know, when you're reaching out to touch individuals like that, people with disability, people who are challenged, you, you, you give them a grant for tokenism to recognize that there's a problem, there's an issue. But what did they do? One of the first things they did was to actually remove the increase that had been introduced by the former government and to brought it back down to $200. And you sit there and you listen you listen, um, and I'm not going to repeat what the member of Castro Central has said, because I think his response was admirable in, in all the circumstances. And, and I think he's quite right. There's so much that he did not touch um, dealing with the management of the economy in, the, in, in that between that period, 2016 and, and 2021. The fundamental reality is that if you had an economy who suffered a, a, a debt to GDP re, um, reduction of, of some 24, 26 percent, and we need to confirm what the exact figure is because we keep on hearing it's 24, 26 percent. The fact of the matter is that no government should be taking credit um, when there is a rebound because any economy that has suffered a, such a severe loss of GDP because of a particular situation, once that situation is remedied, that economy is bound to recover. I mean, that's an iron law. I mean, you look at Grenada, for example, when Grenada was um, damaged by that hurricane. The fact of an incumbent government is to uh, an incumbent government's responsibility is to nurse that that recovery well aware it will come. And this is what this current government has been doing to nurse this recovery, to nudge, continue to nudge discovery, albeit that it is on a natural path of recovery, but to do nothing that will cause any danger or any harm to allow that recovery to continue to take place and, and to grow and develop. And this is what's happening. So when the members from Miku South of Miku South attempt to claim credit for this rebounding the economy, I mean, he's really cl um, clutching straws because that's absolutely nothing to do with the former government at all. If anything, that rut we are in has been due to the recklessness of that government, and as I said, a member for Castro Central spoke about it earlier on. Mr. Speaker, I saw a recent statement in one of our regional newspapers regarding the deliberations of the executive board of the IMF on the St. Lucian economy um, following the Article 4 consultation of our economy. And uh, the executive board commented on the fact that St. Lucia has been severely affected by COVID. In fact, it led off that discussion on that basis, and after speaking of the severe impact on COVID, then proceeded to address other issues like the impact um, of the war in, in Ukraine. Um, and it is interesting, the choice of language severely impacted, and I want to spend a few minutes to, to dwell um, on that. I guess, Mr. Speaker, my point of departure, and I want now to link up to the comments I made about the Caribbean Development Bank, is this, that when banks and institutions are seeking to develop programs to assist countries to recover from debilitating economic events, there is a responsibility to really look at real problems. What are the real problems of people that needs to be addressed? And that's my issue. That there is a reluctance to really look at these very real problems and see whether programs could be devised to deal with those problems. Our bureaucrats are all guilty. They are because a lot of them basically 
they believe in the theology of the World Bank and, and the IMF, so they're just as guilty because they have not really, they have not really adjusted their economic thinking in that regard because they see things in very narrow prisms of dollars and cents. Mr. Speaker, I was hoping that I might have heard from the, the minister how we can reach out to some of our people who, for example, cannot pay their utility bills. I don't know what is the experience of honorable members, but I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, I have a monumental problem in my constituency, Mr. Speaker. I am bombarded with requests to pay for water bills and to pay for water electricity bills. Why? Because Lucy Lek has come back with a vengeance. You don't pay, they disconnect you. Wasco has followed suit with a vengeance. You don't pay, they disconnect you. The reality of this situation, Mr. Speaker, is that during COVID, quite rightly, these agencies decided not to disconnect persons to allow them to continue to use water. And it is, it's, 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 it was responsible of these agencies to do those things. I mean, we all knew that we were in this together. All of us had to suffer collectively. And of course, I haven't even spoken about the banks because, you know, I have in the past spoken repeatedly about issues of banking and how they affect people's lives. In other words, Mr. Speaker, laudable as this program is, as the Minister explained, and as the Minister of Finance has explained, but I still sense that the program is really not touching some of the fundamental issues that ordinary St. Lucians have to face on a daily basis, particularly with respect to those two entities, Lucilec and, of course, Wasco. My question is this. We are talking of very poor people, and I have seen some uh, extraordinary bills. $4,000 for water, $3,000, $4,000 for electricity, um, etc. And I accept, Mr. Speaker, that no government can ever take responsibility for going to pay people's water bills for them or pay electricity bills for them. I would not support that. I would not support that. And as much as I happen to have, happen to have had the honor of, of leading a government that had a responsibility to the poor and leading a government that sought to change the lives of persons and leading a government that reached to touch the lives of poor people by the institutions that it created, whether it's for the Poverty Reduction Fund that became the SSDF <laughs> and, you know, or whether it is the electrification program of the country, whatever it is, whether it was the elderly home care program that we are repeating today, whether it's all those things. That was the, the nerves of, 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 of that government. So th there's no question um, about that, but at the same time, we do have to be very careful of embedding this dependency syndrome in the society where people feel <laughs> that the it is a government's responsibility to pay for everything, every living thing. I mean, I'm still astonished when I hear people see, seem to want to argue that the government has not moved to touch their lives. And the, minute the member of you fought North gave eloquent examples, whether it is the laptop program or uh, whether it is the, the program to pay CXC fees, although I might have had a different approach. Um, in respect of CXC fees, but that's besides the point. Or for that matter, facilities fees. These are real programs that touch people in need. So there can be no question about the legacy, the thinking and the approach of the government. All that I'm saying is that there are some areas where I think that our people have very real problems that, have, that needs to be considered. Now, Mr. Speaker, I have made the point that I don't think you can go and pay out people's electricity bills for them offer that by the go and pay their water bills. The government just doesn't have the ability or the capacity to do it. And whether member for Miku South accepts it or not, 
the greatest the disaster that occurred in this country is not just COVID, you know, but it is his management of the economy between 2016 and 2021. It is not an accident. No, 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 it's not an accident that St. Lucia has suffered a debt, uh, sorry, uh, uh, GDP um, reduction of 24% or 26%. That's not an accident. It happened, it was exacerbated because of those policies. Antigua has a tourism dependent economy, it didn't suffer to the same degree that St. Lucia did. I mean, those policies had to create the situation that we are in and we have found themselves in. So Mr. Speaker, we need to, 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 um, to be clear what we are dealing with and uh, what has to be done um, for the future. But to return to this issue, Mr. Speaker, as I have said before, I do not believe that any government should do a lot of money or just ask, ask oh, what is the bill that people owe that's unpaid or select what is the bill that's unpaid and just do a lot of money. The government doesn't have the capacity can do it. But on the other hand, I believe that the responsible ministers need to sit with these agencies and say, listen, we have to structure an approach to enable those people to meet their commitments to you. We have to find an approach. And it's unfair that person have to be routinely disconnected on all fronts, whether it's electricity and water, and they don't have the capacity because the reality is that the vast majority of these persons continue to be unemployed for reasons that we know. In other words, what I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, is that we require um, interventions um, discussions with these agencies to say, listen, this is not the way you can. We're not going to wipe away those debts. We can't pay for those debts, but we need a more sustainable approach. Do you know what parliamentarians are left with, Mr. Speaker? I either have to take the, side, but the money I get as a backbencher sometimes and help out, or I have to end up calling Lucilek and plead with the person at the end of the line who is responsible for, for, um, for unpaid accounts and seek to negotiate. And invariably negotiation requires you to pay down a certain sum of money before the person can be reconnected. And in my experience, in the vast majority of cases, those persons are on, um, fall, fall again. And lo and behold, they can't pay and they're disconnected one more time. This time in perpetuity. And they're back on your doorstep. So some moral suasion has to be applied and I really want to urge that the responsible ministers engage those agencies in discussions to see what adjustments can be made. For example, if you owe $3,000 in unpaid electricity bill, why would you tell a person to you have to pay down $600 or $800 and then you have to pay $300 a month when you know the person can't do it? What are we dealing with? So, Mr. Speaker, I call for these kinds of interventions as I have called for such interventions, for example, with government agencies that are owed money, for example, by tenants and they refuse to understand that they have to make adjustments to allow those persons to recover. The recovery from COVID is not going to occur overnight. It will take time, just as the government's economy, just as the management of the economy will require a lot of dexterity, a lot of skill, a lot of patience. But Mr. Speaker, I have stood in this house and also said that I will not be a hypocrite to what I have preached and what I have said before. I have said so. I believe I will hold on to my faith unless there are overwhelming reasons why I have to change my mind and if I have to change my mind I will say so why I'm changing my mind. That has been my, my position. That is why, Mr. Speaker, I was very pleased by the comments made by the member for Vivot North regarding COVID. But you know, Mr. Speaker, in opposition, 
I have said and I will say again. We need an independent assessment of how we handled COVID. The question is whether as a country we took the right decisions, whether we handled COVID beyond criticism, whether we gave the best medical care that was available, whether the medical care we provided failed us and failed our people. To date, Mr. Speaker, over 400 persons have died in St. Lucia. And when we look at those statistics and we reduce them to a per capita basis, it is a significant number of deaths. All of us have been touched by COVID. I lost, I lost relatives, uh, Mr. Speaker. So like a lot of other people, I understood what the pain was. And it's still for me an issue that we are allowing those deaths to recede into memory, into history. Human beings have a strange way of dealing with issues of death. So it, it really fascinates me how we handle and, and deal with, with issues of death. I mean, it's unbelievable sometimes that those persons who have lost their lives, the families who have suffered, we have just pretend that they don't exist or they don't have any real pain of one kind or another. You know, this country has never really s said to those families, we feel for you, we know what you went through. As a country, we have never done it. And I remember pleading and saying, listen, we need to come together as a country and just in memory of those of, that was too much for us to do, we never did it. But I maintain my position, Mr. Speaker, that our handling of COVID, we need an assessment. You know why, Mr. Speaker? Because we, we, have must, we must develop the will, we must develop the courage to change those things which we did wrong for the future to build a more resilient healthcare system. And people are searching for all kinds of praises about how they handle COVID, etc. But while they are searching for praises, they are also not saying what it is that they did wrong to, to unleash such pain and suffering on this, on this country and the people of this country. I have great admiration for the doctors, I have great admiration for the nurses. But I know we also did a lot of things wrong. I know there were those who didn't have the courage to treat COVID patients. I know all of that. We can't pretend that those things did not exist. And so, Mr. Speaker, my view has always been that as we address those issues of COVID, and consistently with the view that we are severely impacted, that at some point, Mr. Speaker, that we do this review so that we can strengthen our health systems and to ensure that those issues are not repeated. I believe that the member for the Fort North also is absolutely correct to draw attention to the future of COVID and those who, who suffered with COVID and the complications that could, be, that could arise. It is a huge issue, a monumental issue, and it's really the tip of the iceberg when you read all the reports, both from uh, in the region and, and elsewhere. And it means that sooner or later that we have to come to terms with the history of res resources in the healthcare sector and how we resolve it. And I'm really very glad that the member is alive to those issues and that some discernible progress is being made on that universal healthcare um, UHC front. I think this is going to be vital, but at the same time, um, we've got to prepare for that wave and also to prepare for the future. So Mr. Speaker, in summary then, this is welcome initiative. The government is to be, in my view, commended. I accept the imperf imperfections in the instrument. I accept that the government finds itself in a difficult position because it's dealing with unimaginative bureaucrats and decision makers in the region and elsewhere. Um, my, I, I really have
have in, in, at this stage of my life no need to make any apologies for anything that I say. I say, I think about it very carefully and when I speak of those bureaucrats, they know exactly who I mean and what I mean. So, I mean, let's pretend that they, 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 they don't know what, what, what I mean. They're doing a disservice and they're unrealistic in the expectations of people, unrealistic in respect of what the governments require, unrealistic of what the future holds, and insensitive to the real needs of, of, of individuals. I mean, when you really look at this program, and the minister did a great job, you could see how carefully the program is hedged with all kinds of petty little requirements all over the place and it's going to be interesting to see how it's going to be administered. I can't understand how a program like that, 14 million, you're spending 1.5 million in administering a program like that? Why well, you should be spending 1.5 million in administering a program like that? What is, the, what is it with a program like that that the um, Caribbean Development Bank is imposing on the government? 1.5 million? You don't know what 1.5 million can do for me in Beaufort? You can give me the money to pay those electricity bills I'm talking about. What are you talking about? What are you spending 1.5 million? But that's how they think. And they're the greatest enemies of progress because, you see, Mr. Speaker, what has happened is that they have become ossified in their thinking as technocrats. You know, these regional technocrats don't understand the world has changed, you know. They don't know, you know. They don't know what is facing these islands. They don't know what is, what, what is facing the world. They don't even understand the political imperatives that apply. That's a tragedy, Mr. Speaker. And these are the issues that we have. But then, Mr. Speaker, that doesn't absorb us from looking at our own problems. And that's been the burden of my contribution to say, look, even if we want to be constrained by these people in, in terms of what we can do and how we can help them and how we can touch lives, we need to be also be imaginative of how we deal with their own problems. And I end with the plea that I made. Both Lucilek and Wasco needs to be engaged to see how we can help out the poor in this country rather than putting them um, in despair because simply they can't enjoy the basic utilities and facilities which they ought to have. That is what I mean when we sometimes have to look at very real problems. They can't, these agencies cannot be allowed to do what they want with people's lives and politicians are not supposed to speak um, to these issues. We are elected by people to speak about all of these issues. And I hope, uh, Mr. Speaker, that we can do this quickly and that somehow some respite would be provided to those who have been denied those services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.